Hi there. So we're going to get back into Revelation 20. Um, yesterday we covered the first three verses. Where, um, and we'll just jump over there. <clears throat> you know, it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil, Satan, <clears throat> and bound him in chains for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit which he then shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. Afterward, he must be released for a little while. Now, we, we study this in depth, these three verses. Um, I did a little more reading and study, and because I was wondering, um, why release him, you know? But during Christ's thousand-year reign on earth, um, we'll have physical bodies, how many people do you think will be born in a thousand years? Billions, billions and billions, okay? And even though Christ is, is the king and he rules with an iron rod, they will still have free will. And some will still choose not to follow Jesus, even though he's right there in front of them. Okay, a lot, actually. And that's why Satan must be released for a little while afterwards. But anyways, we're going we're gonna to study 4 through 6 today. As you can see, this is... Revelation 20 is cut up into very, three very distinct sections. The thousand years, the defeat of Satan, and the final judgment. And we're going to finish the thousand years today. <clears throat> and I don't know if we'll get to the defeat of Satan or not. But um, Okay, here we go. Verse 4. Then I saw thrones, and people sitting on them had been given the authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus for proclaiming the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They all came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Okay, now this tells you right here, okay, that these people were the ones that lived during the tribulation. That's when the mark of the beast is going to come around, on the foreheads and on the hands. Okay, I'm not talking about Christians, I'm not talking about about Christ's church, Christ's bride, the church, okay? They've already been raptured, okay? A lot of people don't believe in that. You know, I do, and there's plenty of evidence to back it up. And, and at some point, we'll do a study specifically on the rapture. There's plenty of good stuff out there. And people that believe in true tribulation rapture and rapture during the tribulation and rapture at the end, you know, the second coming, and they're all valid points. Um, the main thing is just to follow Jesus and, and get him in your heart. And You know, when you're taken, you're taken. Okay? So, so these people that he saw were people from the tribulation. And, the, and, and Christ church isn't mentioned here. Okay? This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. And they would be judged. Okay? Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them the second death holds no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay. Now that's 4 through 6. And we're going to jump over here. And he has like six chapters, long chapters, on just chapter 20, Revelation 20. And they're long. I mean, we're not going to read all of them. I mean, we'll, we'll touch on, you know, some of the more important parts. Okay. And this is what we just read. I saw thrones which were seated in the... Okay. And we'll start here. Okay. One of the most treasured subjects in the whole Bible is its indisputable presentation of life after death. Practically all human beings dream of walking from death into an eternal state of bliss, but only the Bible gives authoritative de details about it. In fact, it is mentioned so frequently that if there is no resurrection of the dead, the Bible becomes unreliable. Now, the Sadducees in Jesus' time believed there was no resurrection of the dead. Every promise to believers concerning an afterlife is predicated on a bodily resurrection. <clears throat> the expression, the resurrection, from among the dead is found 49 times in scripture. Okay. Revelation 24 through 6 
which was said, is the only passage that labels the believer's resurrection. It's important to understand that just as there are two phases of Christ's coming, one, the rapture of the church, that's us, and two, the glorious appearing, so there are three phases to the resurrection of believers. Got that? Three. One, the church, that's us. Two, seven years later, the Old Testament saints, and finally three, the tribulation saints. John merges them all together when he says, blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. Okay. Church age change, phase one. Okay, we're going to go into that. The, the saints of the church age will be resurrected in the first phase of the first resurrection, as outlined in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18. This passage described the rapture of the church when all Christians will be resurrected. The resurrection, according to Paul, will concern only the dead in Christ. Okay, now that's us. If you become saved, you are born again, which means you're dead in Christ. That's what he's talking about. Okay. And those who have fallen asleep in Jesus are dead. Thus it will be limited to the church age, consisting solely of those who are born again believers. The rapture will include an old test will include no Old Testament saints. In Christ is uniformly used in the New Testament as a theological reference to those who have been baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ and denotes the saints after the day of Pentecost. Okay. And that would be us living now before the tribulation. Okay. And the Old Testament saints, phase two, which you talked about up here, you know, seven years later, the Old Testament saints. Dr. Walvoord notes that the Old Testament seems to be, seems to place the resurrection of Israel after the tribulation. Daniel 12, immediately after the description of the tribulation in the preceding chapter, deliverance is promised Israel at the close of the tribulation, at the end, okay? And it says in Daniel, 12, 1 and 2. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. Jesus said that in Matthew 24. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will wake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay. The suggestion that Israel will be resurrected prior to the tribulation saints results from a com comparison of Revelation 19, 7 through 9 with, Psalm, with Psalm 50, 1 through 6. At the marriage supper of the Lamb, Israel will be in attendance as friends of the bridegroom. Since the marriage supper will occur just prior to the glorious appearing, we may assume that Israel will be resurrected before the glorious appearing, while the tribulation saints are raised during or at his glorious appearing. Okay, that's the second coming. And the reason you got to believe there's a rapture and not a tribulation rapture like they came to, you know, the second coming, is the marriage of the church, you know. There will be people resurrected, raptured before the second coming. Okay, and it's obvious because of the marriage supper and the marriage, the church is the bride of Christ. Yeah. Tribulation saints phase three. Revelation 6, 9 through 11 presents a picture of the tribulation saints who have been martyred for the testimony of the Lamb, waiting for the resurrection, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers was completed. Right? Obviously, to, to all the people that were going to be beheaded were. This obviously refers to the end of the tribulation period, at which time when Christ comes in his glory to set up his millennial kingdom, the tribulation saints will be resurrected. That's when he says, when he comes down and he will call... The angels will call everybody from the heavens to the ends of the earth. That would be all these people. This accords with our text. I saw thrones, Revelation 24. I saw thrones on which were seated those who have been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who have been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had, they had not worshipped the beast or his image. They did not receive his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. In order to live, the tribulation saints must be resurrected, right? This evidently will take place while the angel is binding Satan just prior to or at the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom. Note the accompanying charge of these three phases. And that's this chart right here. Okay. okay. This happy and holy ones, the unbelieving dead. Okay. 
I'm just perusing this real quick. Revelation 26 is shy the eternal state of those taking part in the first resurrection as blessed and holy. Blessed means happy, caused by the blessing of God. Such happiness is linked with holiness. Human beings cannot enjoy uninterrupted blessings today because of sin. All those resurrected in the first or believer's resurrection will be resurrected holy. Thus the blessing of God, his original intent for the human race, will never be withheld because they will live eternally holy and therefore eternally happy. Wow, sounds nice. Those who partake of this first resurrection will be unusually happy because the second death has no power over them. Revelation 26. Fear of death is one of the primary causes of present unhappiness, right? People today can escape mentally from it or try to amuse themselves until they are unaware of it. But if they think at all, it disrupts what happiness they may have with their present state of mind. No Christian should fear death. The book of Revelation clarifies that our Lord and Savior holds the keys of death in Hades. And thus the second death, or the lake of fire, has no power over us. No wonder believers are happy. Their participation in the first resurrection has made them impervious to the second death. Right. The unbelieving dead. Who are these who are called the rest of the dead? About this there is no question. They are the unbelievers of all ages. Luke 16, 19-31 demonstrates that after death they exist in Hades. We will see in our study of the last part of this chapter that they will be brought out of Hades and judged, then cast alive into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Since these unbelievers are not resurrected to life but to death, a state of separation from God, they are referred to as having part in the second death. The second resurrection, then, is a resurrection to death. Wow. The chart below sharply contrasts the nature of the two resurrections. Right. And this is the first resurrection versus the second one. Okay. Involves witnesses of Jesus, and all those deceived will occur before the millennium. Hmm? Will occur after the millennium. Okay. It came to life. It came to death. Judged, judged. Okay become priests and rulers with God in Christ, tormented day and night, God's sons, they was found no place for them. Or then the second death has no power, they were cast in the lake of fire, enjoy eternal life, suffer everlasting punishment, happy and holy, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. What determines your resurrection? That's a quick question. The answer to this question signifies clearly your relationship to the one who does the resurrecting. I can never consider First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 without pointing out the condition of verse 14. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. The condition of being part of the resurrection of believers rests in personal acceptance of Christ's death for our sins. According to the scriptures in his resurrection on the third day, according to the scriptures, right here would be a good time to ask yourself, am I ready for that resurrection? Have I met that condition? Right? Will I be part of it? If your answer is negative, may I encourage you to accept Christ now. Call on him, assured of his promise that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Right. Just as John announced, blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection, so it follows that tragic and horrible are those who have part in the second resurrection. For to have part in the second resurrection is to be eternally lost. At any cost, avoid that resurrection by calling on Jesus today so that you may partake of the first resurrection and that you may be one of the Christ at his of Christ at his coming when I think of all these momentous events taking place at the end of time I cannot think of anyone I would rather belong to than Jesus Christ right okay now this is rather long I'm not sure how much of this we're going to cover but we'll try and cover the important parts all right, we're at 13 minutes. Okay. Let's take a break real quick. So, let's talk about Revelation 20, the millennium and church history. Now, this section this reads 1 through 6, and we read that already. Um, the kingdom of Christ in relation to his coming. Uh, there's three different views on this, okay? One of them's just about dead, and one of them really makes no sense. And the other one where it talks about the millennium, okay? The millennium term is derived from the Latin words mille, meaning 1,000, and anum, which means a year, 1,000 years. It is unfortunate that the term millennium has replaced the more scriptural term kingdom. This period of time will literally fulfill the prayer our Lord taught his followers to pray, your kingdom come. That was in Matthew, the Lord's Prayer. 
point of controversy throughout church history regarding the kingdom essentially concerns whether Christ will come before the kingdom is ushered in or whether the world will get better and better and Christ will come to a righteous earth by spiritualizing by spiritualizing scriptures some have even tried to explain away the millennium right these three concepts known as premillennialism postmillennialism and amillennialism easy for me to say to find the area of conflict. Before examining the nature of the kingdom itself, we must first review the content of these views. Note when they were introduced into the church and examine them in the light of scripture. Okay, now I'm just gonna cover what they are. Okay, this is just, it just goes on forever. But, and I would suggest you get this book. Okay, it's Revelation Unveiled by Tim LaHaye. It's put up by Zondervan Publishing and you can get him anywhere. This this is actually a, an, um, an Amazon Kindle version of it. And I have three hard copies of it too, so. Because I've studied this a lot. Mm -hmm. So, where were we? Okay. Now, premillennialism, we're going to go through these three just briefly to say what they are. The premillennial view is that is the view that holds that Christ will return to earth literally and bodily before the millennium age begins and that by his presence a kingdom will be instituted over which he will reign. Okay, that's the end of the tribulation. The glorious appearance, the second coming, he comes through the sky with his, with his angels and, you know, the battle and wipes everybody out and then sets up his kingdom. Okay, that's what I believe. That's the oldest view. And it, I mean, it's literally what the Bible says. Okay. And this goes into great detail about why that is so. You can see. Okay, now this amillennialism holds that there will be no literal millennium on the earth following the second coming of Christ. It tends to spiritualize all the prophets concerning the kingdom and attributes to the church, those prophecies relating to Israel. Okay. Its adherents are divided on whether the millennium is being fulfilled now on earth. Augustine said that long time ago, or whether it is being fulfilled by the saints in heaven. It may be summed up in the idea that there will be no more millennium than there is now, and that the eternal state immediately following is the second coming of Christ. All right. Anybody believes that you're in the middle of this thousand years of reign by Jesus? You question that? Really? <laughs> okay. But some people believe that. Okay. Postmillennialism. The most recent of the three. There we gotta hide it. The most recent of the three major views concerning the establishment of the millennium is almost extinct at present time. Postmillennialism basically suggests that the world will get better and better until the whole world is Christianized, at which time Christ will return to a kingdom of peace. This view was originally originated by Daniel Whitby, who lived in, you know, 1700s, a Unitarian con. Controversialist in England. Huh. Although he was censored for some of his heretical views, particularly on the subject of the Trinity, many conservative theologists rapidly embraced his and propagated his viewpoint on the millennium. Right. So, yeah, that's just about dead. I mean, seeing what you see now, you believe the earth will get better and better, and, you know, and, and once it's already. Crisis can come down and say, okay, thanks for making it. I'll take over from here. Or will, you know, all the Bible I read say he will actually usher in the new kingdom. Okay. So, and there's reasons for accepting the, the premillennium view. You know that, you know. This is evidence. When Christ comes, he will raise the dead, but the righteous dead are to be raised before the millennium, that they may reign with Christ during the thousand years. Okay? Pre-millennium. Number two, when Christ comes, he will separate the tares from the wheat. But as the millennium is a period of universal righteousness, the separation of the tares and wheat must take place before the millennium. Therefore, there can be no millennium before Christ comes. Right? Number three, when Christ comes, Satan shall be bound. Okay, so there can be no millennium until Christ comes. When Christ comes, Antichrist is to be destroyed, but as Antichrist is to come before the millennium, there can be no millennium until Christ comes. That's Antichrist. Number five, when Christ comes, the Jews are to be restored to their own land, but as, but as they are to be restored to their own land before the millennium, there can be no millennium before Christ comes. Okay. 
When Christ comes, it will be unexpectedly, and we are commanded to watch lest ye take place sin and worse. Now, if he's not coming until after the millennium, and the millennium is not yet here, why command us to watch for an event that is over a thousand years off? All right. These are only some of the reasons why why we anticipate the coming of Christ before the millennium. In addition, it is clear that teaching of the Bible Revelation 19 pictures Christ coming literally to the earth, slaying Antichrist and casting him alive into the lake of fire. Antichrist, not Satan. After Satan is bound, Christ will rule with his saints. A literal interpretation of scripture will invariably point one to the premillennial return of Christ to the earth. Right? Makes sense. Okay. Now, chapter 36, the coming kingdom of Christ. This covers Revelation 1 to 10. Okay. There can be no doubt as to the scriptural evidence for the coming kingdom of Christ. There are literally hundreds of verses in the Bible that predict an earthly kingdom of God ruled by the Son of God and superseding all kingdoms of the world. Most of the prophets treat this subject at length after after holding it out as a source of encouragement to children of Israel in their most desperate days. In this chapter, we give an exposition of some of the longer passages following chapter. will contain a description of the millennium from some of the shorter passages. Then text will be briefly compared in order to help. Okay, this is very long. Okay, this gets the kingdom according to Daniel. And there's lots of people with the coming king. It was written in Psalm by David. Lots of Psalms. He talked about it. Ezekiel's prophecies of the world kingdom coming. There's a thousand year reign. The millennial kingdom according to Zechariah the prophet. The Millennial Kingdom according to the prophet Isaiah. Okay. The renovation of the earth by fire. Okay. Most prophetic teachers acknowledge that the earth will be renovated by fire, but for some reason they insist on locating this event at the end of the millennium. Isaiah 65 and 17, however, preceding the description of the millennium, indicates that God will create a new heavens and new earth before the kingdom is established. That means he will create a new atmospheric heaven around the earth and will reestablish earth as a far better bit on a far better basis. We learn from other passages that the that the waste areas of the world will be recreated. Today three quarters of the earth is wasted by water, making much of the earth unusable. At that time the vast mountain ranges will be leveled and the earth will enjoy a complete resurfacing before the millennium. Now it talks about the earthquakes and stuff that will level every mountain. Okay. The same period of time is referred to in 2 Peter 3. The apostle predicts that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires and suggesting that since no changes have occurred in creation since the beginning, there's no reason to believe the fact of Christ's coming. They, re they reject the change of the flood and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The apostle points out to believers that they are not so, not so limited by such biased concepts. Right. Peter further states that with with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, meaning that God's promises of 2,000 years ago are only two days old. <laughs> then he predicts that the day of the Lord will usher in a time of cataclysmic change on the earth. The earth will be dissolved, meaning the surface of the earth in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord then will done with the destruction of this old earth and the refurbishing of its surface on which God will establish his kingdom of righteousness. The times described by Peter are upon us. <laughs> right. Certainly every child of God today should heed his words since everything will be destroyed by the, by in this way. What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God. Right. Okay. Now, next it goes into Satan's final conflict. And we're going to stop there because that's a different, um, that's a different chapter. That goes to the defeat of Satan over here in, in 7. And we can read 4 through 6 again. Then I saw the thrones of the people sitting on them and given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus for proclaiming the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They all came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them the second death holds no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. Okay. So, they're dead, they're brought back to life. Christ will be there first. Now, I am going to briefly go to Revelation 3.
Because you notice it, it does not talk about Christ's church. Okay. And it starts here in Revelation 3 10. He's talking about the church of Philadelphia. Okay. Okay. And how this church, you have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. I will force those belonging to who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they are Jews but are not. There's a whole movement of that. To come and bow down at your feet, they will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. And here's the important part. <clears throat> because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. And that's the tribulation. Okay. Okay. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. Now that's 310, Church of Philadelphia. Okay. We will be protected from the tribulation. Does it mean a rapture? No. I mean, maybe it'll happen and we just won't be aware of it. But, you know, I mean, we see on the news today, there's certainly a lot of bad news out there and earthquakes and fires and, you know, just lots of nasty stuff. I don't see it separating Christians from non-Christians, so I don't think that's part of the tribulation. I honestly don't think the tribulation has started yet. But I think it's very close. So, so that's, I just wanted to point that verse out real quick on why in here it talks about, you know, the saints, the people from the tribulation who have been beheaded and didn't accept the mark of the beast, but it doesn't mention the church, okay, who has already been, you know, and we read before that, you know, Jesus comes for his bride, which is the church. And after that is the church, is the wedding feast. And all the people that weren't part of the church, I mean, the bride of Christ, the church, are the ones who were dead in Christ and accepted Christ as their Savior. Okay, the Old Testament saints didn't do that. I mean, Christ wasn't around. They're still going to heaven. They will be the guests at the wedding feast. So, and that house was just before the millennium. So, that's 24 through 7. And this will obviously take at least one more session to cover chapter 20. And we will talk about, you know, the final judgment and the defeat of Satan. Okay. But that will be exciting. Till next time, stay tuned. Keep reading, keep praying. Get Christ in here. Fast as you can. See you tomorrow.